Hey, this is Will with Texas Low Income Housing Information Service. I'm here with our fair housing planner, Charlie Duncan. Earlier this month, HUD launched an investigation after the city of Houston uh, refused to approve funding for the Fountain View Apartments, a mixed income development proposed by the Houston Housing Authority. Uh, the federal government is now investigating whether the placement of affordable housing in Houston violates the Fair Housing Act. And Charlie is going to help us understand why the Fountain View Apartments turned into such a big deal and how it kind of relates to the legacy of housing segregation and public disinvestment in Houston. Uh, so first of all, Charlie, just how segregated is the city of Houston? Houston, like most other U.S. cities, is very segregated, both racially and economically. Um, let's get into a look at, a look at economic segregation okay. first. Um, in 2014, the city of Houston commissioned the reinvestment fund out of Philadelphia to perform one of its market value analyses. Uh, this looks at factors such as uh, how, uh, foreclosures, um, median sales prices of homes, uh, median incomes, the prevalence of, of uh, code violations, and vacant properties and the like. By looking at all these different factors, it gauges what's the strength of that housing market in, the, in that area. Are, are, are people moving there? Are people leaving? Are the markets thriving there or are they weak? The result of that analysis is this map you see here. The areas in blue and purple here in, in western Houston are the strongest markets while you get into the pinks and purple or the, the pinks here and reds uh, are the weakest markets. And you can see that that is there's a you know very clear you know split That's between true. where those weak and strong markets are. Now the interesting thing about this analysis is it did not look at things like poverty and race. However, when I trace, I trace roughly this this blue and purple area of strongest markets, and overlay that on a map of poverty here in this instance. You can see that, that uh, those strongest markets align quite closely with where the lowest poverty rates are in the city of Houston, as demonstrated here by this rough arrow shape here. Yes, yeah, so we refer to this area just going forward as the arrow. We'll call it the arrow, right. And um, you know, here you've got poverty rates of 20% or less, you know, down to 10%, even 5%. While out here, outside of the area, we've got much higher rates of poverty, you know, above 40% and beyond. Now, as I mentioned, the city is also quite racially segregated. Uh, here is a racial dot map. Each of these dots represents five people of a particular racial or ethnic group. Blue are white non-Hispanics, green is African American, uh, orange is Hispanics or Latinos, and Reds are uh, Asian Americans. And you can see the highest concentrations of white non-Hispanics within the city limits exist right here in the arrow, those are that area of strongest markets. While many uh, uh, minority groups, Hispanics and Latinos and African Americans are largely excluded from this area of, uh, of prosperity, strong markets, and high-functioning economy. So in this fair housing investigation mm -hmm. that's going around Fountain View, the idea of a high opportunity neighborhood has become very important, and that has a lot to do with this extreme racial and economic inequality between neighborhoods inside and outside of the arrow. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a frequent question, I think, in many circles, you know, what exactly is high opportunity? And there's no single, you know, you know, ironclad definition, but there are things that are uh, consistently synonymous with what high opportunity is. And in general, the idea of high opportunity is that it offers a quality of life uh, that facilitates and encourages successful outcomes for those who have access to it. Um, some of those things are access to low poverty areas outside of concentrations of poverty. Access to good schools is very important. Um, living in an area that's free of environmental hazards mm -hmm. and undesirable land uses, which is good for your health and mm -hmm. just your general level of stress and quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, low crime rates, 
uh, access to quality goods and services, including a good grocery store and retail, and near job centers, so that everything you need um, can be roughly within your area and you're not being asked to you know, commute across the town to very large cities such as Houston to access those things that you need you know, day to day. And so in Houston, why does this divide between high opportunity neighborhoods and others exist? Why is there this great inequality between neighborhoods? Uh, well, this inequality is longstanding. Um, you know, essentially since the days of Reconstruction in the end of the 19th century, um, there were very, you know, there were, there were classes of people um, set, and those classes were largely along uh, racial and ethnic lines. More recent than Reconstruction was the practice of redlining. Um, this was a government condoned policy where uh, the federal government, the, the, more specifically the Federal Housing Administration, um, graded or ranked um, areas of cities as a guide for whether or not banks should be lending in these areas. And in effect, those areas had almost no chance of receiving any type of lending. Very often these redlined areas, the areas that were defined as hazardous, um, closely uh, aligned with African American neighborhoods. So you can see here, this is a map of, uh, a, a racial dot map of 1950 Houston with a 1952 city limit here mm -hmm. in gray. These outlines here are the different security rank, uh, ratings that uh, were, were given to these areas. Uh, the greens and blues are stronger, uh, are, you know, less risky mm -hmm. according to uh, the FHA, while uh, the red and yellows were more hazardous and were, banks were advised to not lend there, and they didn't very largely. And so you had a result of people not being able to acquire mortgages, to buy a home in those areas, or to perform repairs on your home and uh, entrepreneurs could not get a loan to open businesses in those areas. So there was just widespread disinvestment in areas that were redlined while other areas received uh, investment. A result of this was not just private disinvestment, but public disinvestment. Um, here in, in purple, these lines up here are open drainage ditches. This is a form of uh, drainage infrastructure you would generally see reserved for uh, smaller towns and rural areas, not in higher density areas like the city of Houston. Um, however, many neighborhoods, uh, when their, these subdivisions were built, uh, had the provision of open drainage ditches rather than an underground sewer system that most of us living in cities enjoy. Um, you can see in many instances these open drainage ditches align with areas that were redlined or deemed uh, definitely declining and outlined in yellow, and then other neighborhoods that weren't yet part of the city that were not reviewed, like this is Sunnyside down here, and Acres Homes up here, um, also are high, heavily dependent on open drainage ditches. Now if we go move into the future, like I say, this was 1950, you know, we could see over time how uh, the uh, African American population expanded in the city, it grew in the city, but was largely confined to the kind of these three sectors, to the northwest, northeast, and south, despite the city's rapid growth over these years. And a similar outcome for uh, Hispanics or Latinos here, um, we used people of Mexican descent as a proxy to see where those uh, those groups lived because that's a data set consistent over these decades. And you can see there, uh, those groups are largely confined to north and east Houston and again kept out of the arrow. Mm -hmm. in, in 20, this is 2013 data. The city of Houston has expanded rapidly. You can see kind of the light gray out here that depicts the city limits, redlined areas, the security ratings are still here. And these are the drainage ditches that still exist today, the open drainage ditches. And you can see that the, today, despite these areas having been annexed by the city for 40, 50, 60 years, they are still relying on that outdated infrastructure that, uh, that they were relied upon, you know, upon their initially being annexed. So neighborhoods were racially segregated, 
economically segregated, and then fail and still fail to receive the consistent and appropriate level of public investment in services like drainage and, and many others. And as has been at issue recently around the Fountain View case, this is where almost all public housing in Houston has been built, right? Yes, uh, many of the Houston Housing Authority uh, public housing developments shown here in gray by the gray squares uh, are located in, in these lower opportunity disinvested areas. You can see within Loop 610, um, in the oldest part of Houston, many of these public housing developments were built in a time when segregation was still enforceable during, you know, under Jim Crow laws in areas that were uh, redlined at the time and many of those developments lie in or near those areas. When you get outside of the loop, um, you can see there are many public housing developments here in the north reliant, uh, in areas reliant on open drainage ditch, ditches, which are an indicator of a lower level of investment, and, uh, and some others out here um, along, the, along the Beltway and the fringes of, of southern Houston. And so how does the location of almost all public housing in Houston in these types of neighborhoods increase racial segregation? They do so because much of the uh, public housing population are people of color, um, pri primarily African Americans. Uh, shown here in these pie charts in green uh, is the uh, African American population of all public housing developments uh, uh, administered by the Houston Housing Authority. Uh, in orange are white populations, which may include some Hispanics. And you can see in almost every development, um, African Americans make up the majority of the populations there. So by placing these developments in areas which are also predominantly uh, African American neighborhoods, the Houston Housing Authority is essentially promoting a policy of segregation. And that hasn't changed much since the Jim Crow era of when public housing was often specifically segregated for only African American tenants. Correct. Yeah, many many of these older developments at a time were for African Americans only or for whites only. And it's not just public housing that looks like this, right? In mm -hmm. Houston, it's almost all subsidized housing. Correct. Here we can see uh, the locations of households using a uh, housing choice voucher. Uh, all the green dots here are African American uh, housing choice vouchers. They make up about 88% of all uh, voucher holders uh, administered by HHA. And you can see again, they are largely con uh, concentrated in these same uh, predominantly African American neighborhoods to the south, to the northwest and northeast, um, as well as down here um, near the Fort Bend County line. You can also see the location of competitive low income housing tax credit locations. Again, largely concentrated in some of those same areas while being almost completely. Uh, excluded from uh, the area within the arrow. And together we can look at all of these together along with project-based Section 8 developments to see a very clear pattern where if you are dependent on low-income housing you are confined to these areas and you're kept out of the most prosperous area, the highest opportunity area of the city of Houston within the arrow. And here is why we see the Fountain View proposed development has been such a big deal. It is located inside the Arrow in a very different neighborhood than almost any other subsidized housing development. Correct. And so what have been some of the consequences of this extreme segregation of subsidized housing within low-income neighborhoods of color? People who are dependent on uh, the Houston Housing Authority for affordable housing have uh, limited choices available to them. And those choices uh, result in access to uh, many uh, low per only low performing schools around the city. Uh, here in red and orange we can see schools um, uh, with the lowest achievement indices uh, as determined by the Texas Education Agency. While here in the arrow you can see a lot more greens and yellows, much higher performing schools. So again if we go back here you, you look at where 
affordable housing developments are, and that very much aligns with this kind of backward C shape here um, around Northeast and South Houston. Those same people are also more likely to be in close proximity to uh, environmental hazards, which affect your health, provide a nuisance, affect your quality of life, and uh, tend to really depreciate areas and uh, drive away an investment that might otherwise be interested in these neighborhoods. So here we see sites that emit carcinogens, landfills, radioactive sites, Superfund sites, right. a whole host of unhealthy, dangerous sites. Yeah, these are all different types of sites which are monitored and regulated under different programs by the EPA and the TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So you've painted a fairly disturbing picture of housing segregation in Houston, how it relates to race, poverty, but also to poor school quality, dangerous environmental conditions, and, and many other things. What are some of the steps that the city can start to take? How can we start to remedy this? One thing the city can do is to recognize the importance of the Fountain View project to what HHA's mission is. It goes beyond just providing a affordable roof over people's heads. Um, the, as you know, I've shown here, uh, the policy of the Houston Housing Authority and the city of Houston has been to keep affordable housing in one part of the city and not offer those choices in another part of the city. And that needs to be overcome. And the Fountain View Project is one very small step in doing that. Um, people need to have choices. We all are, you know, us who do not rely on affordable housing have the benefit of choice and it means a lot to our outcomes just as much as it means to those of lesser means. So those affordable housing choices need to be offered everywhere, particularly in the areas of high opportunity that we described <laughs> earlier. Now, that policy has to be in conjunction with remedying the long history and legacy of disinvestment in these areas. These areas cannot be abandoned. Uh, they, they make up you know, a majority of the city's population after all, and, uh, and there's a lot of great things and opportunities to be had in those areas, but they have been stifled for decade after decade by the placement of uh, undesirable land uses, by not investing in infrastructure, by uh, not allowing for access to high quality education, and just not giving the people who were born and raised there a real fair shot at, at opportunity and success in their lives. Charlie, thanks for uh, explaining some of this to us. All of these maps and much more information about Fountain View and the Houston Housing Authority and neighborhood conditions in Houston is available on our website, texashousers.net.